Man, that's why I'm American starting to like to watch other sports around the world. You know, yeah. the NFL frustrating me has been actually a really good thing for me because it's really opened up the floodgates to what other sports we'd like. I mean, I started watching some rugby matches. I started watching um, some American soccer, which, right, uh, isn't that great American soccer. But it's really led us to the AFL in Australia, man. And watching that just unbelievable, beautiful game over there, the footy, um, I, I get excited, man. Like, I, the other day we, we had uh, – um, one of our listeners tell us to look up Mason Cox, right? And I, I Sammy Dog, thank you, Sammy Dog, for telling me about Ma um, uh, Mason Cox because you know you see these guys that are just so incredibly talented, talented and gifted, and it's like holy shit, it, Mason Cox, like he's looks like he's six seven. I don't know his size, but six seven, six eight, and he's like 50, 60 pounds heavier than everybody else that he's going up against, and. You know, I, I see these guys that are truly talented in the a AFL, and it's like, holy fuck, man, that right there is what the NFL should look like. Like, it really is. Like, wide open spaces, lots of spaces, lots of places to go. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful setup for matches, and I love it. So I, I would love for the NFL to have something where they open up the field more, you know, make it more difficult to hit – uh, these guys at a, at a fast pace, you know, like, I don't know, man, there has to be a change. There has to be something that they can do to start protecting these guys. Yeah. In the NFL. I agree. I don't know that the game will transition. There is something really special about the way that Australian football has played into open spaces and it's beautiful. You dude. Know, obviously we've come to start appreciating Australian football through learning uh, more about Josh Giddy and his upbringing, but, and I don't have the name in front of me and I apologize for that, but one of our listeners mentioned that most players, almost everybody in Australia starts out playing footy and then they transition over sure. time. Some of them will end up in basketball, but generally speaking, having a player who's like a top level junior player in footy and basketball isn't unusual. So like a player You're like right. Patty Mills is someone who, did that. Um, I'm not sure of other guys. I know that they, they, they've been mentioned, but I don't have it in front of me. But it's a regular thing for Australian players to be really good at both. And then somewhere have to make a choice which one. And generally speaking, they usually go with footy. Yeah. And I think that's an interesting factor to understand about Australian culture that doesn't like really quickly like translate. Like if people had the choice between like basketball and football – Generally speaking, they're going basketball sure. in today's day and age. There used to be a day, right, where if they were elite at both, they would go football. Sure. And now, depending on maybe your ceiling, um, but like Tony Gonzalez, for he was a great um, tight end. Um, he he was a great basketball player and football player. But with all the head injuries, more and more yep. people are saying, "Hey, if you got a chance to play basketball instead of football, that's where you should go." And sure. I, I can't I can't deny that, that that makes a lot of sense. And then you look at it and you say, like, well, Australian football, is it's still a physical game. I'm sure concussions are a ma massive concern. They don't wear pads and they have bone-crushing hits. But it's still interesting that that's out in front of basketball, especially now looking at this, this bit of a pipeline between Australian um, juniors in the NBL and all the way to the NBA – Sure. Um, we talked about it last episode, Bronny James, but yep. Lamelo Ball. We always mention Josh Giddy. Terrence Ferguson was a player for the Thunder. Yep. T. Ferg. Um, we got um, Green. English. I think is his name of, um, in um, Dallas. Um, there, there, there's players all around, and it's really interesting to see kind of where this where this has led. But the sure. NBL, I don't know, man. It's it's fun to watch, but understanding that it's competing even within its own country. And it's even though it's like the number two basketball league as far as competitiveness, I think th th there's an argument made to be made about the European leagues. But as far as like what translates best to the NBA, it's yeah. number two. It still is also number two in, in its own country. Sure. And then <clears throat> I think that when you utilize the sports that you learn as a young player, as a young child, to help your game, it, it shows where the game is at. Like like you said, 
football was always used um, as a sport that people used to get started in, you know, like running around, flag football, all this other stuff, passing, running, you know, like backyard, it doesn't matter. Like most kids start with some type of football in America playing sport, you know, like, and well, that's the eighties and nineties, at least, you know, as of recent, I feel like it's made this massive change. And I think it's because parents look at it and being like, I, as much as I, my kid might like football, I don't want them to do that. You know, like my daughter is trying to figure out what type of sport she wants to play. And she's like, Oh, I think I want to play basketball. And I'm like, okay, let's play basketball. Like, be careful with basketball. You know, like one out of every three girls tears their ACL. And it's like, I didn't necessarily want her to play that sport. So when she's like, Hey, I think I want to go into row or crew. I was like, cool. Like that is a very safe sport. I'm down with that. Like 88% of the girls that are in crew or row don't ever have a serious injury. And that's insane. You know, like I look at that as, as one of those moments that, okay, this is something that's good. And I think a lot of parents are, are assess, uh, assessing that like, okay, your child is going to be a massive child. You know, typically like a big child. Okay, cool. I'm sticking him in football, you know, offensive line, defensive line, you know, tight end, um, quarterback, if they're lucky, like, you know, like a big kid equals, you know, a, a great position, but now it's looking at like big kid. Okay. Let's get him in, in basketball. And yeah. the way that basketball has developed, it's really helped that because kids are going in there learning how to shoot, dribble, pass early on. And, and, it's unlike any other sport in that aspect, because if you, if you know the basics and you're learning footwork from football and footwork from footy, you know, from Australia, like this stuff makes you a better player. So I, I like it, man. And I look at this, this Thunder team and you have, you know, Osman Jang and you have um, Josh Giddy, you have other guys that have spent time in, in overseas. And this is what we need to have with this team. You know, we need to have guys that are willing to do whatever it takes. And last night, the Thunder had a game. Yeah. Pretty fucking amazing to watch because if you look at what they're doing right now is, I yes, we played a team from Israel. Um, Mark Arar, I, it doesn't matter. I'm not even going to try it. Uh, I just tried. But I'm not going to try to say the whole thing because I think it would um, go really badly. But. I look at this Thunder team and how they're completely developing these young players. And it makes me really excited because if you look at it, the core of these guys, you got the three guys that I'm consistently circling. I'm saying these three guys are going to make us a championship caliber team. Okay. And because you need meat in order to have, you know, any type of, 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 of food when it comes to meat, you need some meat to get food. Right. Well, I mean, you could have your bones, you could not, have right? your ankles, you could have your everything else like that. But without, without meat, you got nothing. And I look at, I look at those three guys as being J Dub. Well, let's go the 11th pick Ozman Jang, the 12th pick J Dub, and the other guy, which was the year before our 18th pick, which is Trey Mann. Those three guys are our meat to this team because those guys are going to change how everything goes for this organization it's the good picks that are the top picks that we're always going to look at like josh giddy and chet you know and uh well i mean you got shea at number 11 as well but you're going to look at those guys as the the foundation blocks but it's what happens or the bones of the the situation but it's the meat man the meat makes you a championship caliber team and you see what's happening with the golden state warriors and you recognize that you have steph you have clay you have all the other pieces that you have right but really, the person that brings everything together and creates an atmosphere for everybody is Draymond Green. You take that away from a, a championship caliber team and the person that runs the ship, what happens? We don't know. Yeah. But that meat is on our team, and we have three young guys that are going to be truly spectacular. And watching Trey Mann and watching Osman Jang and watching J-Dub just dominate, it's got to get you guys excited. Yeah, we saw Dort play for the first time. Um, of the preseason after multiple um, shoulder surgeries or two shoulder surgeries on opposite ones. So um, he played really well. Four of nine from downtown. His shot looked really smooth. Um, I mean, there's a lot we could say about Dort, but I would say offensively, 
he looks like he's been building on his game. And the the catch and shoot smoothness is is really at a different level. And I feel like he's at the point where teams are going to have to take defending him on the perimeter seriously, which is going to open up a lot of opportunities to get to the basket. Dude, I agree. You know, I've said it in prior episodes uh, last year, we got made fun of when we said that Dort is going to be a 20 plus player, um, a night guy um, coming up here soon. This is what Dort's setting up to be. I mean, if you look at it, the way that this team is structured, right? It, it makes it difficult to leave anybody at all. But somebody like Dort is always going to be like, okay, would you rather Dort or Osman Jang? Dort shooting a three or Osman Jang hitting a, you know, um, uh, hitting a layup, dunking the ball, whatever, okay? You want Josh Giddy shooting a three, or do you want him driving to the hole, right? Dort is going to be the guy that's going to benefit the most from the way that this team is structured, yeah. okay? Because he is going to be able to sit in his sweet spots that he likes the most, and he's just going to sit there and soak up. You know, like, sometimes you just get in, you just want to soak it, you just want to let it sit there for a minute and not move. That's what Dort is going to be like, man. He's going to get out to that sweet spot. And he's going to sit there, and nobody's going to recognize that Dort's still sitting there, man. And it's over. Because right. Dort is going to go fucking off. And everybody's going to sit there and be like, "He's how did he go from 17 to 22 points a game? Well, it's because some guys need a little bit longer in the league to get things to roll together. And when the Thunder went out and got Coach England, I knew it. I knew it immediately. The two guys who are going to benefit the most was Josh Giddy and Dort. And if you look at their shots, man, they're so fucking sick. So sick, bro. Yeah, and then we it's saw quick. Jang come out and, and play with a different level of smoothness that we've seen from him yet. Everything from step back threes to dribble into his shots to getting to the basket. We saw like three dunks from him. And so I get sick. it. It's not NBA competition, but I feel like for what I'm seeing from him, like he's going to be able to do this Whenever he figures out what he wants to do out on the court, with his size, there's going to be like less people out there to stop him. So him like really coming into his own, and you know I think that's going to happen in a big way. I mean he went eight for twelve, um, and it was just a different it's level of smoothness. Man. Yeah, it is. It really is. He's he's like we we said when we drafted him, I felt like J Dub at the 12 was allowing Sam Presti to put Osman Jang in the G league to start off because, you know, I, I felt like that's a way of, of, you know, Hey, you're going to have to go through a little bit more shit. So here's a little bit extra money for that, <clears throat> you know? Yeah. But watching Osman Jang play, I, I quickly, I mean, I get it preseason and, you know, summer league. It's not, it's not foolproof, right? But watching him and the way that he understands the game and passes the ball and lets the ball like I I'm more convinced that he's the future of French basketball. Like he is the person of that's going to represent France in, in the Olympics, that's gonna represent France for the for the future. And he's Victor. So, so spectacular. I mean bro, I I, I get it. I understand that you have Victor, and I understand that you have other guys, Gobert, that are that are great French players, man. But the reality is, is Osman Jang, he's one of those guys that understands the game in such a way that it, it's it's powerful. It's powerful watching him because he understands where to be at on defense, yet on the opposite side, he understands where exactly to be on offense, and then he knows exactly where to pass the ball. You know, he doesn't try to force anything. He's not trying to do anything that's abnormal. He's just playing basketball inside of the system that he's allowed to play in. And, bro, he fits so well. It's so effortless. And that's why it's like maybe at this point without Chet starting, maybe you get that starting position to Osman Jang. Maybe you're like, hey, listen, go out there at the power forward. You know, go bump the bodies with with the power forwards out there or – Go play against LeBron or go play against, like, see what he can do. Yes, he's not going to do always do amazing. He's going to, you know, fall and fail. But that's, but listen, when you have kids, I always say when you have kids, you want your children to fail inside of your house. Rather than waiting until they're 18, 19 years old and starting to fail out there and not know how to handle it, right? 
You want Osman Jang to go out there in a free year, right? To go out there and see what he can do. Because if you press somebody like that, I mean, you could just find out that Osman Jang's way better than anybody could ever have imagined just by doing stuff like that. And I think Sam Presti and, and Coach D understand that. And that's why I think he's going to get a ton of playing time, never needing to go to the G League because he's just that fucking good. Yeah, dude. And, and I'm pretty sure we won't see J-Dub go to spend any time out there with the G League. He looked really good. 13 assists for him, 15 points. Um, just overall, so big. like, yeah, and his, his control – when he's playing in the pick and roll or he has any action where he has the ball in his hand, he keeps his head up. He knows how to get the ball to the um, team, his teammates when they're, you know, in front of the other guy where they have the advantage. But he moves to places with the ball, right? Yeah. By directing the traffic. Like, it's unlike anything I've, I've seen from a rookie before is he recognizes that if he moves this way, the offense is going to move this way, and then he's going to have open lanes. Right. You know how some guards bring up the ball and they bring up to the top of the key and they sit there and they're observing to see what happens, you know, or they cut, bring it to the right and start the offense right away? Well, he comes out there and he's recognizing that if he goes to the spot right away, he's going to be a backdoor cut. Or if he goes to this spot right away, there's an alley-oop. Or if he goes to this spot right away, there's an open three. Yeah. The offense is just effortless again with J-Dub. And I, and, I, and I can sit here and I can talk about this rookie class, but – this rookie class is going to be like any of, unlike any other rookie class for us ever in the history of the Thunder. Maybe even in the history of the league. Because if you look at, like we saw, talked about before, we looked at Victor's Crypto Knight, right? Chet. Then we've got Osman Jang. And then we've got J Dub. And then we got Jalen Williams. And the way that our defense is designed, it funnels guys down the lane to face up against J Will or, um, J. Will or JRE. And those guys love to take charges. Oh, and and throwing Kenny Hustle in there. He'll take a charge yeah. anytime. Like yeah. these guys, it, the game has changed so much in, in a year. The charge is real now. People aren't trying to block shots all the time. People aren't trying to do that. They're funneling people down the lane to take people to take charges. They recognize that this is how the game can change, is that these guys get in foul trouble, boom, they're out of the game. What's more frustrating for a uh, a star point guard to drive down the lane to go for an easy bucket and get a charge? It's so frustrating for a guard to do that because if he can't find a way to score inside, it, it, it makes it impossible for him to get in rhythm to shoot outside. And that's yeah. what we do so well is that these guards, they, they body upright. If the guy gets by him, he gets by him because Jay Will's down there. Right. It's dude. This this team is designed so perfectly. It's it's truly incredible. And watching all these guys be able to mature together is going to be one of the most spectacular things that, that we as sports fans have ever been able to, to witness. Yeah, and that's what it's all about, man, at this stage. Just watching it happen. Poku, he's looked really good this preseason. and There's a lot to prove. You know, proving but he's the preseason not a score. doesn't mean anything. Right. He's not a he's Poku will never be a fifteen to eighteen point scorer a night. Never. But he could be a seven to eight assist point guard or guard, not guard, man a night. He could have seven to eight assists every single night with like nine points and five rebounds. That could be Poku's night. But I'm good with that. I mean that that's good for what we need. Yeah. I mean the Swiss Army Knives, right? And you go down the list, we saw Amari play at a really high level. David Nwaba. What do you think about him, man? Both of these guys, I like him a lot. I uh, like Amari a lot, man. I, You know, he played for, was it Dallas last year? Then he got played for our G League. But before that, he played for Oregon. Right. <laughs> I, I like him. I, I really, I look at him as one of those guys that, you know, he's not the biggest body out there but he hustles like kenny hustle hustles he hustles and he he talks to the guys he communicates with people he's not a quiet individual in the aspect of sitting back and, and letting people do stuff he's always in there um e even when the, the coaches are talking to the players he's he's listening he's he's trying to figure out exactly i like those guys those guys teach great professional habits 
Yeah. You know, like that's what we need on this team is uh, so many guys like that to keep these younger guys in line. And he's only right. 24 or 25. And early on, you bring these guys in for those types of reasons. Over time, they can transition to guys like Lou Dort and Kenny Hustle, who become cornerstones of this new generation. And we always say it, but Sam Press has been able to build this culture of winning in the face of losing. Yep. And these types of guys are the, really the, the key to that, the catalyst. They're the ones who come in and say, like, I'm ready to go to work every day to earn a job in the NBA. And those professional habits, you know, once they're given opportunities, they look really good. And look, we, we promised ourselves we wouldn't get overexcited about the preseason. That's a challenge always for us. But we got two more games coming up, and then we're off into the regular season it's exciting. Eight days, nine days, something like that. Yeah, so fast, man. So we're off. We're ready. Um, we, we appreciate everybody you know, joining us on this off season as we focus in on this season that we think will be really big. Either way, even if we don't get a lot of wins, it's going to be a big season for this, this team's progression. Absolutely, man. Watching this team, again, starting to work together. We, we heard Sam Presti talk about it, you know, Finding a team, drafting a team, putting a team together, it's its all very difficult to do. But finding a team that works together well is one of the most difficult things. And what we're watching in front of us is something that is – we've talked about it before in prior seasons that this is Sam Pressy's, Pressy's masterpiece. And we, we talked about the masterpiece the first year that we're part of it, right? Because yeah. we saw what was happening. Yeah. Our first episode, we start talking about Sam Pressy's masterpiece because we wanted everybody to understand – where this was going. Like Sam Presti was going to, we didn't know where or how many or players or whatever like that we're going to draft, but he, we knew he was going to put us in a position to win for generations. And that's why mm -hmm. we were always telling people this team's not tanking. This team's not tanking because we didn't want this team to tank because it was about the winning culture, man. And that word tanking is such a like nasty word. It destroys the winning culture in organizations. And it's, that's why we consistently said this is not tanking. And it wasn't until the end of the year where people started recognizing what we we're saying and they changed the whole entire way they, they talked about what this team was doing. And they started calling it um, a rebuild or a soft rebuild or whatever words that they used that were instead of a complete straight, you know, stripped down. But this team has been built the right way. It's been built by finding the players that are going to teach your young guys how to have professional habits right making sure that they're in contracts that represent what they're going to be doing. And Kenny Hustle took one for the team and Dort took one for the team. Those guys together are what, a hundred million dollars over the next four years. That's a hell of a deal for those two guys. Yeah. And I I'm excited, man. I'm excited to see what's going to happen. I'm excited to see how it's all going to flow because as the NBA gets higher in salaries, man, like we're going to be able to see this team do some amazing things, and it's at a hundred and what thirty-five million this year, um, the top of the salary, the near in salary cap at one fifty. But that's the point: is the Thunder are going to be peaking at the right time? And everybody's been talking about, oh, well, we won't be able to sign all these players in four years. Well, guess what? If the NBA goes up to two hundred million dollars for salary cap, which I think it could in the next four years, then guess what? We can do. We can yeah. afford somehow to keep all these guys. And as massive homers of this team, we hope that we can keep all of them. But in the end, we know we have new picks coming. We have people who will end up on other teams and find themselves successful there. And we're cheering for that, as always, for all these guys. So absolutely, yeah, we, we are excited that you guys continue to join us. And we, um, we're going to wrap this one up a little bit early, but we'll be back Wednesday. Fresh energy, new episode. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you then.